Hello, uh, my name is Gabe. I work on uh, Facebook. I'm a product designer on the VR team. Um, just so to have like the mandatory like audience participation part, like uh, who has tried VR before? Who has seen VR but hasn't tried it? And who hates uh, raising their hand at the beginning of a presentation? Um, cool. So uh, what I do at Facebook, I, I work on Facebook experiences for VR, uh, which is a little different than Oculus, which is focused on building hardware and proprietary experiences for Oculus. Uh, and I figured I could walk you guys through some of the learnings I've had uh, while working in VR. I've spent about a year working there. Um, and uh, maybe we can uh, have some shared learnings here. So um, maybe we can start by imagining that is. France in 1896. Maybe you're a French uh, boy with your baguette or something. Um, <laughs> and you are uh, on your way to this new thing called the cinema. Um, and then you see something like this. But if it was 1896 and you're in France, it's actually not boring at all. Like you'd probably be terrified at this. In fact, a lot of people thought that was an actual train that was like coming towards the screen and about to kill them. Like this random German magazine I found uh, said that it had a particular lasting impact. Yes, it caused fear, terror, and even panic. And it's hard to believe how that video can cause that many emotions, um, especially since we've seen so many things on screen since then. We've seen people's cut in half. We've seen you know, werewolves on skateboards uh, through space. We've seen Oompa Loompas running for president. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, 1896 was for film what 2017 is for VR. We're at the very beginning of the VR, VR set technology. And just the simplest um, executions of it can really have a lasting impact on people. Um, so the following are just four different lessons I've learned um, as I try to dive into VR. Uh, but keep in mind that we're at the very beginning of VR, and it's, it, we've got a long way to go before it becomes the mature industry that something like mobile or web is today. So these four um, things are simple. One, context of use. Two, barrier to entry. Three, input. And four, comfort. These are things that are unique to VR in a way that they play a bigger role in VR than they do on mobile. Um, which is where I come from. First, context of use. If you think of mobile, um, it, your phone is kind of like your companion, right? A lot of people are used to using their phone on the train or on the go, and that's actually one of the, the selling points of, of mobile, right? So it's such an exciting technology. However, VR, um, when you think of VR, it's, it's not often like this. People think of like being in, immersed in this world where they're in this like, giant room with no obstacles around them, and they have a friend that can you know, guard them to make sure that they won't uh, uh, run into anything. If, if you uh, really think about it, then you think you're like, sitting down on this like, swivel chair or something where you're, uh, like, you can turn around in, in 360 degrees and go anywhere you like. But actually, the way most people use VR is in a couch. Uh, so they don't have access to 360 degrees. They have access to about 180, and even 180 is a little uncomfortable. And they don't have access to all these new, uh, really immersive tools uh, to interact with VR. So understanding context of use when designing for VR is, is important, and where we are today and where we want to go, and how we bring people from sitting in a couch 
with a slightly bigger screen on their faces to really inhabiting a new world. The second is similar, uh, it's about barrier to entry. And again, comparing it to mobile, pulling out your phone is the simplest thing ever. And even things like Alexa and other, uh, and other technologies are making interacting with technology a lot more uh, frictionless, where today we still have a lot of friction for interacting with VR. The actual way um, people do it is they're sitting on their couch and maybe they have a phone they have access, that has access to a headset and they have the headset conveniently in a, a nightstand next to them. Um, but they might find something on their phone and might uh, want to um, exp experience what's new in VR. So they have to then pull out the headset, connect the phone into the headset, and put that headset in their face. Um, <laughs> so it's important to realize that now they have something on their face that is uh, you know, obscuring everything else from their reality. So the, the added benefit that your product should give you in order for you to go through all these steps to use your, your product should be really high uh, to actually encourage people to not only do this for the first time, but to come back and do it over and over again. If you don't have a, a phone that can do that, then the other option is having a um, desktop uh, setup, which is even harder to get, right? So this setup is a, costs around $1,500. Uh, it forces you to use a PC, so nobody in this room could use it. Uh, <laughs> And um, it's now tethered to a desktop, right? So, um, so th this idea of being on the train and, and diving into your product your, or your technology in a way that is really seamless with your life, uh, we're not there yet. So the, the, um, the value that we need to provide to give, pe give people a reason to do all of this and to acquire all this equipment needs to be really high. So this, this combination of things um, kind of makes me think of VR as a destination, um, as opposed to a companion, which is what I would categorize the um, mobile technology to be. So if you think of VR as, as a destination, something that you go, that you plan, something more akin uh, to the living room technology, uh, you know, like a, a living room TV or something like that, I think we can create experiences that really are uh, tailored towards that. The third um, point is around input. And right now, input for uh, VR is really varied. There, there is a standard for uh, mobile and web. Uh, mobile, basically, you, we, we can assume that people have a, a screen that you can tap or swipe. Um, and for, for the web, we have you know, uh, a keyboard and a mouse that we can rely on. For VR, things that are a little, uh, there's, there's kind of a bigger spectrum. You can interact with VR from your phone. In fact, this is how most people interact with VR. You can, they can move their phone and, and page through a 360 degrees video or photo. You can interact with VR uh, basically with your gaze only. So um, this doesn't require any sort of uh, um, interaction. So, the interac so imagine hovering over a button for two seconds. That's how you select it without any sort of uh, input. Or you can maybe use the, the tap or swiping mechanism on, on the devices like the Gear VR, where not only do you have gaze, but you have a one or two um, uh, signals for input. If you're really adventurous, then you can buy a gamepad and try to uh, pair that with your headset. So now, not only do you have gaze, but you have however many buttons that gamepad has, so you can design an experience for that. And the ultimate uh, kind of experience is to have a, uh, a hand controllers that really track your, your position within the world and even your fingers so you can make hand gestures and really create a sense of presence for whatever experience you're in VR. So we have this spectrum um, all the way from a phone to something like the Oculus Touch, which you just saw. Um, and they all, they're all unique. They all have their own uh, way of interacting with um, with the content. And there's a pretty steep curve for immersion here. Um, things like the phone or Google Cardboard or Gear VR have very limited ways to interact with the content. However, we have a, a kind of opposite uh, curve here, which is around adoption. Most, like, most everyone has a phone, um, and the easiest thing to acquire beyond the phone is something like Cardboard. 
So it's important to consider this, this uh, relationship between where people are today and where you can make the most compelling experiences to really immerse someone with their content. And lastly is um, a consideration around comfort. Comfort is especially important in VR. Um, so as, a, for, as an example, maybe some of you have seen this uh, diagram before. It kind of tells you where in your phone it's easy or, or hard to tap something, right? Um, so if you have an iPhone 6 Plus uh, or 7 Plus, you, you know, tapping back on, uh, on an app is kind of uncomfortable. I think we've all kind of experienced that. And you, you design solutions around that. But the worst thing that could happen is that someone complains about it or like it has an achy thumb or something. Um, in VR, if you make something that is uncomfortable, people can actually literally throw up. <laughs> uh, so imagine walking into a design critique, somebody using your phone, and the response is actually throwing up. <laughs> uh, that, is, that is kind of where we are with VR. You, you really need to consider uh, like you, your, your body's reaction to your, to your content and your experiences. And one thing we've, we've realized is that showing people a sense of the... Um, the ground plane is kind of really important for VR. So um, when you think about VR, the first thing you think about is probably something like Minority Report or Iron Man, or at least that's what I thought about. Um, and you imagine just interacting with all this content, moving the world around you and being super immersive. And if you try to design with VR, that's probably the first thing you do. And then you immediately realize how bad of an idea that is. Uh, because Designing, um, moving your world around you sends your brain a signal that your, your ears actually, who hold uh, the balance of, of your body, um, have a, a kind of dissonance with. There's this thing called the vestibular system where um, if, if your brain senses that it's moving but your body is not moving, then that gives you um, a bit of a, a really nausea. Um, so a solution to that that we found is that by showing a... As, as, as UI moves in the, in the plane, by showing a ground that is still and consistent, that helps uh, avoid that, um, that problem. And uh, the folks at Oculus have, have uh, released a few kind of best practices for designing for comfort. Things like uh, keeping the UI still, um, moving your head left and right is a lot more comfortable than moving your head up and down. So uh, paginating horizontally is, rec is recommended. Uh, keeping a UI within your field of view, so not requiring you to like turn 180 degrees to hit the back button or something like that. Um, you know, a curving UI around you so that everything is equidistant from you, right? If you imagine you have a panel of a UI in front of you and, and it's a flat panel, the things on the edges are farther away than whatever is in, is in the middle. So that's why you'll see a lot of curved UIs in VR. And also making things that are equidistant uh, from each other so that um, you can anticipate um, how to access those pieces of UI. So that's it. Uh, this is the four uh, pieces of, of, of learnings that, I, that I've uh, found. Um, I think what's, um, what I'll leave you guys with is just a way to uh, really just dive into it and try the assumptions that, that you think will make a great VR experience and, um, and contribute to the the community we have of uh, trying to understand how to design for VR, because it's very early. Um, and I'll leave you guys with one last thing. Um, because of that community, we started a website where we are documenting our learnings in VR. So if you're interested in it, you can um, jump in and, and learn al along with us. So that is it. That's me. Thank you.